Let's start in prayer. The Lord be with you. Father, we thank you for um, bringing us here today. We thank you for um, this opportunity that we have um, to talk about the, the gift of marriage and the gift of um, the, the wonderful joy of being a husband. Um, Lord, I pray especially for those who are not married or who are not in the state of marriage that you will help them uh, see in your word today um, things that will help and nourish and encourage them as well. Um, and I pray for us husbands that you will convict us and lead us to uh, more rightly fulfill the task you've given us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so uh, as we were saying this morning in children, children's education, in adult education, um, every bit of God's word is useful for teaching and all the other stuff that Timothy, Timothy says, is, or Paul says to Timothy that it's good for. So even today, if you are not a husband or uh, you're not even a man, um, then you can get something out of the sermon today. So I want you to listen and ask the Holy Spirit to help you um, uh, be encouraged and nourished um, by what we're going to talk about. Um, we are going to talk about chapter uh, 3, verse 19 of Colossians. So if you have a Bible, please open it there. And um, I've arranged this in two parts. The first part is, and, and the, the parts are in keeping with the verse itself. Uh, so the first section of the verse is, Husband love, Husbands, love your wives. So we're going to talk about the sacrifice um, of that call, and we're also going to talk about the leadership that's being, um, that's being uh, given to us at this, in this call. And then the second half of the sermon, we're going to be talking about the second part of the verse, which is um, don't be harsh with your, with your wives. So um, just to give you a kind of preview for where we're going. Okay, so if you're in chapter three, oh, wait, one more thing. Uh, Set a marker in Ephesians chapter 5. You might also want to set a marker in Genesis 2. But you don't have to do that one. But Ephesians 5 will be probably necessary. Okay, so husbands love your wives. Now this is not the first time in Colossians chapter 3 that we have seen or read Paul giving us the command to love. If you look back up in chapter 3, you will see that he tells all believers in Jesus Christ, everyone, everyone, to put on the virtue of love. I believe that's in verse 14. I'm not looking down at my Bible, but I think that's where it is. He tells us to put on the virtue of love. And we said um, that the word, the Greek word there is the word agape, and we defined agape this way. Agape is a sacrificial giving of the self for the good of, of another person without regard for what that person does before or in response to our good acting toward them, right? So it's, it's a decision to do good to another person without regard to what they do to you or how they respond to it. Um, now, we know what this looks like. How do we know what agape looks like? Thank you. Yes, the answer to every question uh, in, the, in the church is Jesus. Yes, uh, we know what this looks like because God shows his love for us in this, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So my life is marked with defiance and um, pride and rebellion. Not completely marked that way, but it does seem to take over my life at various points. Um, but from the very moment or from the very beginning, before the very beginning of, the cre of, cre of God's creative act. He saw that in me. He saw my rebellion. He saw my sin. Even the depths of wickedness that goes on in my mind, he saw that stuff. And yet, from the very beginning, God determined that he was going to save me. And, and to do that, he determined that he was going to give the life of his son. And his son agreed. Now, why is that? Is that because of some wonderful quality in me? That, you know, if I could just give her that sin stuff and that, man, he would be a great asset to my kingdom. If I could just have him, he has so much potential to be a wonderful, wonderful guy. So I'm going to save him because I need him in, in, in my kingdom. No, that's not what happened. There was nothing about me, nothing about me that prompted God to decide, to determine from the very beginning of the cosmos to save me. It was a free choice because he just loved me. 
even if I live out the rest of my life as a wretch, which I probably will, he loves me, right? And so he came, he gave his life for me, and he brought me to the point where I was willing to repent and surrender my life to him, and then he forgave all my sins, past, present, and future, and he gave me his righteousness. It's amazing stuff. And it's not like, again, I can do anything in return, because ongoing, every single day of my life, I continue to do the very things that Jesus saved me out of. You do too. Jesus daily acts in love toward me, even when I'm wicked. And that is the kind of love that you and I are called to reveal, to demonstrate, to live out in our relationship with each other. That's every Christian. Every Christian is called to do that. You are to live as Jesus lived and love as Jesus loved. So we all talked about that three weeks ago. Why, you might ask, does Paul repeat the instruction in verse 19? He tells everyone, okay, all Christians are supposed to love each other. Okay, we know that. And then he comes back down to the husband's duty to the wife, and he says, husbands, love your wives. Why does he repeat that? Well, he didn't tell us, so I'm just going to, I'm just going to, I'm going to, I'm going to tell you what I think the reason is, but I'm, I'm just telling you what I think. It's not there explicitly. Um, but I think this is what's going on. I think he wants husbands reading this verse to de-link verse 18 from verse 19. So, if he just said something like, wives, submit to your husbands, and husbands, be nice to your wives, then we might think that our niceness is somehow connected to her submission. Right, well, I'll help you um, around the house um, when you show me a little respect. I'll stop going out with my friends when you stop spending my money. I'll stop working overtime when you make my coming home worth it. I'll listen when you stop nagging. I'll forgive when you're really sorry. No, see, if he could just said, be nice, be gentle, be kind, be good, we could could do that. We We could link these two verses together. But that's not what he said. He said, husbands, love your wives. That's agape. That's the Jesus kind of love. And that means we don't get to play that game. Jesus acts in love toward you every day, and you're a jerk. And me too. We're jerks. And Jesus acts in love toward us every day. And so I must, no matter how, and, and she always is lovely to me, but even if she wasn't, I would be responsible before God to love her. Not my feelings, although that's there, but the way I act toward her. You get married, in other words, and what you do, when you make decisions, this is why you, if you're not married, you need to be very, very, very careful. Don't marry a woman because you think she's hot, please. Marry a woman because you know this is the woman who you are willing, you are willing to give up your life for because that's exactly what you will be doing when you say, I do. That's precisely what you're saying. You get married, you lay down your life. It's not about you anymore, right? And it probably, you probably got that impression when you were dating because when you're dating, she's all about you. And she's telling you how wonderful you are and how great you are and how what, you know, I, I remember dating in. I was, I was on top of the world. I was, I was great. But, you know, when you get married, then it shifts a little bit, right? <laughs> then it shifts. It's not about you anymore. It's about, it's about her. Your call in life And it becomes before everything else, if you're married, is to be like Jesus for your wife. Her needs become your needs. 
She needs time. You give it. She needs attention. You give it. She needs help. You give it. She needs you to listen. You listen. You are there for her. Turn, if you have your Bibles marked to Ephesians 5, turn over there. Look at verse 21. I don't like verse 21 as much as I like, as I like verse 22, but it's there, so we should look at it. See, because verse 21 precedes everything that comes in verse 22, which is, you know, verse 22 is, hey, hey wives, uh, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. And verse 21 is, submit to each other, right? You see that? So the whole, the whole, the, all the instruction there for wives and for husbands is preceded by this overarching call for you as a man, too, to submit to your wife. And now that doesn't mean necessarily leadership so much. We'll talk about that in a minute. That does mean that you submit your care for yourself and you set it under your care for her. That's what Jesus did, right? He submitted himself to be a servant, even though he didn't have to. Now, wait a minute. I thought I was supposed to be in charge. Um, let's, let's look at that, okay? Um, if you're in Ephesians 5, look down at verses 25 through 27. And, and, and now, as, as we're, as we're, um, we're going to take kind of a shift here. We're, we've, we've said that when you are married, you are setting yourself in a position where you are giving your life up. Now, we're going to see how um, that, that is shaped by and done in the context of leadership. might seem odd, because in the world, when you're the leader, that means you get all the stuff, right? If I'm the boss, I get the big corner office, I get the company car, I get to tell people what to do, I get my little toadies who come into my office and tell me how good I am. That's what you get in the world when you're in charge. In the church, we know it doesn't work like that, does it? Right? So, so yes, there's, there's leadership, and we're going to talk about that in a minute, but that leadership is a Christian kind of leadership, which means you are a servant first. Your wife is not your maid, you're not, your wife is not your servant, your wife is not your, I don't know what you think she is, but you are her leader and her servant. Okay, verses 25 through 27, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her that he might sanctify her having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, that she might be holy and without blemish. We skipped a little bit there. So, so Christ's leadership, his sacrificial leadership, had a purpose or a goal. He was leading his bride to greater holiness. He was leading her to greater goodness, and he was willing to give up himself to do that. Christ's sacrificial leadership had the purpose, and that was the good of his bride, and that good for us, if you think about it, when, when Christ is leading the church, sometimes means that he leads us where we'd rather not go. Have you ever had Jesus tell you to go somewhere you don't want to go? I hope so, because if you haven't, that you're probably not a Christian. Because <laughs> Christians have that experience quite often. Now, Jesus doesn't do that because he's on a power trip and he wants control over his bride. He does that. He sometimes leads us in places we don't want to go because his purpose is our good. Right? Now, that is the purpose of a husband's self-sacrificial leadership as well. To lead for the ultimate good of your wife. A good defined not by what makes you happy, not by your desires, right? A good defined by the word of God and the wisdom of God that comes to you through it. Sometimes, and it ought to be rare, because, you know, this analogy between Jesus and the church is a is, is great analogy, but, I mean, there is one difference. What's one difference between, say, Jesus and the church and us and our wives? Jesus is, like, sinless, right? And he's God. 
and the church is sinful, right? But when we're talking about marriage, what is that? I'm not sinless, I'm sinful, and she's sinful. So there's a little bit of a difference in this, right? So um, our leading of the church isn't exactly like Jesus, lead, our leading of our wives isn't exactly like Jesus' leading of the church, but there's an analogy here. And there are some times, it ought to be rare, but there are some times when your leadership for your wife means not backing down an inch. Sometimes it does mean making decisions she doesn't agree with and risking the fallout because that's what the scriptures call you to do. I, again, it's rare. I'll give you an example. I have a friend down in Texas. No one here? A friend down in Texas. Okay? He has two kids. I'm a pastor. I love children. These kids are hellions. They're horrible, awful, awful children. I love them. They're awful. They're disrespectful. They, whatever they want, mama gives them. Spoiled little brats, right? And what does papa do? Nothing, right? Because every time he tries to discipline, what does mommy do? No, 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 right? And so what's going on in this, in this, in this marriage is the kids are growing up to be spoiled brats. They're going to probably make some stupid, stupid, stupid decisions. And the husband, who's supposed to be the leader, lets it happen. Lets it happen. Now, I'm not saying that this guy should come in and like, All right, we're going to do this, we're going to do that, you better listen to me. I don't, I'm not talking harshness. But there are times when there's a gentle, a necessity for a gentle but clear and, and determined decision to say, no, honey, we're going this way. I'm sorry, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put that kid in timeout or I'm going to spank him or whatever, but I'm not going to let this keep going. There's a time when a, a husband does have to make decisions like that. What's that? Be a parent, right? Um, all right. So uh, let's just—if you have your—if you've opened your Bible to uh, Ephesians, why don't we turn back? If you've also put a marker in Genesis two, and I want to show you something. And I'm not just—well, I want to show you where I'm getting this idea here of, of leadership. Um, now, in Genesis two, you'll see God creates Adam in uh, verse seven. See that? And he commands Adam uh, not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. See that? Um, that's in verses 15 through 17. So Adam's there. God gives Adam the command, uh, don't eat from the tree of the fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? And then in verse 21, uh, he creates Eve. You see that? Right? So she wasn't around for the getting of the command. At least it, as Genesis gives us this, this story, she wasn't there for that. God hands her, um, then, and after he creates her, he brings her to the man. You can see that in verse, in verse 22. He essentially hands her over to Adam's care. So when you go to marriage and the father brings the, 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 the bride down the aisle and hands her to the husband... That's a re-imaging of this. It's a reflection of this. It's not a patriarchal custom. It's just saying Genesis 2. It's what we're doing, right? It's the father being given, um, the father giving his, his daughter um, over uh, in the same way the father gave Eve to Adam. Okay, so now it's Adam's responsibility here to help Eve understand God's word and to follow it. He's the one who knows it. He's the one who's been given it. He's, it's his responsibility to help her get it, right? So, Genesis 3, what happens? Who shows up? The serpent shows up, right? You see that? Now, um, she goes through this period of, of, of wrangling with the serpent. Eve's, Eve's there. She's, she's wrangling with the serpent. He's asking all these questions. She's getting confused. She's getting tempted, frankly. And then look at verse 6. Look at verse 6. Where's Adam? Where's Adam? Huh? You're not sure? Well, if you're looking at your Bible, you'd see it. He's right. She gave him 
the fruit, and he was, where was he? He was standing next to her the entire time. You see that? He was with her. So we, when we watch the cartoons of Adam and Eve, sometimes we think like Adam is off, like, you know, doing something in the other part of the forest, and then Eve came up, and the serpent came up to Eve in secret while he was away. No, he was right there. What's he doing? Nothing. He doesn't protect. He doesn't lead. He doesn't put himself between the serpent and his wife. He sits there and he lets her fail. For the longest time, I thought, well, why does Adam always blame for the fall? And it's Eve. You know, she was the one who made this mistake. Why is Adam? Well, because Adam was there and he was the one who was responsible. How do I know Adam is responsible? Well, who does God question first? If you look down in chapter 3, you'll see it. When he arrives on the scene, he doesn't come to Eve. He comes to Adam. Because it was Adam's responsibility to protect and lead his wife in a Godward direction. Now, what does Adam say in response to God's interrogation or question? You know, what happened? What does, he, what does, that, what does Adam say? The woman you gave me. The woman you gave me. He shifts the blame to his wife, from himself to his wife. Now, everywhere, we don't have time, we're not going to have time to look at, at this principle, but everywhere the subject arises in Scripture, you will see this principle. A husband and a father is held responsible for the actions of his family. Everywhere. That might seem unfair. Okay, so um, a ship, a big ship, is sailing through an ice field, right? Somewhere near the North Pole, okay? Um, the captain's tired. He's been, he's been doing captain stuff for 24 hours, so he's going to go to sleep, and he's li leaving the first mate, who's a great, ca great steerer. I don't know what you call it in the boat, but he's a great steerer person, so he leaves him, him in charge. And the captain goes to sleep. He's going to rest, and uh, sure enough, the first mate, whack, rams into an iceberg. Um, now, okay, now, whose fault is that? No, not with me. The, the, the first mate rammed into the iceberg, right? It's his fault. But when the court of inquiry uh, begins to investigate this, who are they going to hold responsible? The captain, right? It was hey, the first mate's fault. Yeah, yeah, he's, he messed up, but it's the responsibility of the captain. That's the same kind of principle we see in scripture. Your wife's sins are her own, your children's sins are her own, are their own, but the responsibility for leading her in a biblical way is yours. The responsibility for leading your children in a biblical way is yours. You don't have the luxury of pointing fingers when things go wrong. She did this. She didn't do that. This woman you gave me. Go ahead and turn back to Ephesians, Ephesians 5. The fact is, your wife. And we're looking to look at this in a minute, is your body. There's not a real distinction in biblical terms between what your wife does and what you do. Ephesians 5, 28 to 31. Husbands should love their wives as their own bodies. He who loves his wife loves himself. For no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it just as Christ does the church because we are members of his body. Your wife is your body. Her life is your life and you are responsible before God for leading her and your family in a godly way. So, if, if your kids don't Come to Sunday school. If your kids don't know anything about the gospel, and there are kids here who don't, 
if your kids um, just grow up and leave the church and become apostate, yeah, it's their sin. It's your responsibility. It's your responsibility. If your wife is struggling spiritually, if your wife is, is trying to, to hold the household together because you're absent, because you're working too much, you're focused on your career, and she's stressed and she's falling apart, it's on you. It's on you. I don't, you could become, I don't know, what do you do? I mean, I could, excuse me, I could become the most famous preacher in all the world. Everyone could want to come from thousands of miles around to hear me preach. As you can see, it's already taking effect. And they're all here, and they're listening to me preach, and I could be like Billy Graham, right? And, um, and if I treated Anne in a disgraceful way, and I just ignored her, and her life took a dive, and my kids left the house, that would be a scandal. I mean, if that, uh, 1 Timothy 3 says, I shouldn't have any authority in the church if that happens. Because I've negated my first responsibility. A lot of us men are trying to get ahead and trying to win the career game and compete with our colleagues, and our families are dying. It's disgusting. I've heard men blame their wives for not coming to church. It's, it's you. It's you. Spiritual leadership, it doesn't just mean getting them to church and making it really easy to go to church. And It does mean that. It, it does mean that. But it means your life in that home is, is centered around Jesus Christ, that your kids can see you growing in faith and knowledge in God and that you're daily spending time with your kids and with your wife praying and, and opening the Bible and teaching them about Jesus. That's what it means. You are the pastor of your house. You don't foist that off on the church. You bring them to church, but you don't foist that responsibility off on the church. That's you. Make Sunday the best day of the week for your whole family. Move heaven and earth to make it possible for your wife to go to the Bible study or the mission group of her choice. Clear all the kids and the work out of her way so that she can pray and study the Bible and pursue God on her own. Institute a family Bible study time that is interesting and fun. And I don't mean like, sit down, kids, we're going to say the Bible. Right? I mean... Like, make it something they want to do. Jesus is fun. I love Jesus. He's a great guy. Don't make him into a jerk for your kids. Loving your wife, and I'll just say it briefly, and then we'll get on to the next second half here. Loving your wife means giving yourself up in every way, taking actions that are costly to you, that can hurt you, that can make you miserable, but that are for her good, if necessary. Leading her into greater knowledge and love of Jesus. Okay, now, balancing this leadership, if you look at, now I'll turn back to Colossians 3, balancing this sacrificial leadership that you and I and all husbands are called to, and listen, when I'm yelling at you, I'm also yelling at myself, because I've, I've recognized, as we've had more and more kids, my own failings. When they come in and talk to me, I want them to go away. When my wife um, is just talking sometimes, the words just go through my ears, and I just don't register anything she says, and I nod, but I'm not really listening. And so I, I'm, I'm not saying that this is, and I, I, I failed many times on my spiritual responsibility to lead my, my kids into being Christian, so I'm, I'm yelling at all of us. Okay, husbands love your wives, and do not be harsh with them. Now, the husband is the leader, he's not the boss. He's the leader, he's not the drill sergeant. There is no reason, I'm, yelling, I'm raising my voice at men, there is no reason for a man, a husband or not, ever to raise his voice at a woman unless she's standing in the way of a bus and you're saying, get out of the way. No reason. 
I think in some ways, radical feminism has done more harm for women than good because men have been able to step back and treat them as other men. Oh, well, hey, you got a pro you, you, can, you make your way in the world. I'm not going to help you. You're a woman. You can do it. There is no reason ever to raise your voice or to yell at your wife. You can lead gently. You can speak gently. Jesus was gentle with his followers, even when leading them where they didn't want to go. His moments of rage and anger were directed at those who threatened his sheep. His physical strength, which he unleashed in the temple when he cleared it out, his physical strength and, and then his intellectual wit and sarcasm, yes, Jesus was sarcastic every once in a while, were directed toward those who would hurt his church, not toward his church. How often we men reverse that and we're sarcastic to our brides and we use our wit and our intellect to cut them down and cut them to shreds. You know, we learned that in the gym, you know, growing up, because our coach, my, I love my coach, but he, you dirty, nasty, he, you know, we, they yell at us men because we, that's just the way we are, but we take that attitude and we just, the, 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 the ways that we compete with each other as men and we, we turn that aggression inward in our families and we tear our wives down, we tear our kids down. We're sarcastic and we're mean and we're rude to our wives while putting on a gentle and loving face to the world. We come to church, ah, oh, yes, there's my dear wife. You know, in the morning I'd yell at her, right? But when I'm at church, my dear, lovely wife. Why do you think, and I'm speaking in general terms, this isn't true for every man and every female, but why do you think God gave men more muscle mass than women? Why do you think God gave us a kind of aggression and assertiveness? Well, it's so that women and children can be protected and provided for. Nothing is more disgusting or more despicable than when a man uses his physical or mental strength to hurt a woman or a child. It's disgusting. The stench before God. I have four daughters. Someday I'm going to have to walk down the aisle and give each one away to some young jerk or some guy. <laughs> or I, uh, hopefully by the, maybe I can convince one to be a nun or something, I don't know. But, but if I'll tell you, and I'm not speaking now as a pastor, I'm speaking as a man, if I ever see or hear that a man abuses my daughter in any way, I'm taking him out. I have a shotgun down in Texas. Um, I didn't bring it to New York. I'll go get it. <laughs> I'm taking him out. Same thing for Ann. Anyone disrespects my wife or speaks rudely to her or unkindly to her, that makes me just uh, so angry. It enrages me. Now, I'm not saying this is good. I'm not saying this is holy. I'm not saying this is godly, but I think part of it is God, I think, gives men, uh, 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 in some ways, a sense of, of, of holy jealousy for his wife and his children. It's good. That protective instinct is not all bad. But God gave that to me, even though I abuse it sometimes, to reflect his jealous love for the church. But when we reverse that pattern and channel that aggression into the marriage, God is not pleased. If I mistreat Anne in any way, God says in 1 Peter 3, verse 7, I'm not listening to your prayers. You can pray all you want, but if you're harsh with your wife, I'm not listening. He has protective custody and care over his daughter. Now, my father-in-law is in Africa, so he can't do anything to me. Like, but even if he was here, I think I could probably take him. He's kind of, kind of a small guy. But, but her heavenly father, I can't take him. He loves her, and he's going to protect her, and I better care for her, or I'm in trouble. All right, so the Greek word for harshly here might also be translated to embitter. So there's two, two, the commentators are split on how to translate this. 
to embitter, to, to, to cause to be frustrated and angry and, and just not be happy with life. Um, now, men uh, were told then don't embitter your wives. Now, to embitter, um, uh, we're not told exactly how that can happen because he just says it. But I think what he's counting on is that experience um, can easily fill in this gap. And we can see ways very easily, I think, in our experience that we, our actions can embitter our wives here. Are just I just picked out four out of ran- randomly, and I'll give them to you, and then we'll close. The first way we can really frustrate and embitter our wives is through inattention. We touched on it a little bit already. When I don't talk to Anne, or more importantly, when I don't listen to her talk, she grows very, very frustrated. Right? So I'll be, I'll, I'll, I'll say I'm listening to her. I'll have my, maybe I'll have my back turned because I'm laying on the computer and she's talking to me. I'm not listening. She gets very, very frustrated. And by listen, I mean when she's talking, you can actually repeat back to her what she says, right? That's what I mean by listening. When I don't do that, I am bitter and I need to be willing to give up being wrapped up in my job, in me, in my writing, in my sermon, in my time, so that the most important person in my life is not embittered. When I chose to get married, I chose to make her needs my needs. And so she is now more important to me than getting ahead, getting noticed, getting the promotion, or whatever. Second thing, laziness. If you're not sick, like just you can't work, you can't do anything. If you're not sick, and if you don't have a job, and you're sitting around letting your wife pull in all the money and then sucking off that while you're playing video games all day long, you're frustrating your wife. Get up off the couch. Get a job. The Bible's very clear about those who don't work. What does it say? They don't physically eat, right? Men women do look to you to provide, right? So, okay, even if she, if you can't get a job, like you've tried, you just can't do it, clean the house, vacuum, wash the dishes, get up and do something, or your wife is going to grow very, very frustrated with you because you're lazy. She should grow frustrated with you. Third thing, control. Now, there are men who have to control every aspect of their wife's life. Um, That's not leadership, that is tyranny. Your call is to help your wife to become the woman God made her to be, and that means that her gifts are to be used, her skills are to be developed, her strengths are to be accentuated. Even if she's stronger than you in certain areas or she's better than you at certain things, your task is to help her hone and develop those skills and talents. Some men get into this weird competitive mode with their wives. Like if she's better than you at something, you want to shut her down, right? You want to compete with her, undercut her. I, we, we have, a, and, the, and I know a couple in Africa, the husband is not a very good translator of the Bible. The wife is. So what does the husband do? Does he, does he push her out of the way and say, well, I don't care about the gospel. I don't care about the spread of the gospel. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to translate because I'm the man and the leader? No. He backs off and says, hey, I, we're all about trying to serve the gospel. So, honey, why don't you translate the Bible and I'll clean the house? That's okay. That's not, that's not, not leadership. That is leadership. If she's better than you at something, then encourage her to pursue it. Help her and get behind her. That does not take away from your leadership. That's what a leader does. Otherwise, you are frustrating and embittering your wife. Final thing, fourth, um, comparing. I don't know about your wife, but I know my wife spends a lot of time comparing herself to other women negatively. Right? So she'll look at the magazines they get for clothes and stuff, and they'll say, they'll see these very skinny women, and they'll say, I don't look like that. In their mind, they'll say that, right? Um, And... So your most women, I don't care how wonderful they look, have this inner voice that tells them you're ugly, you're fat, and you need to lose weight or no one's going to love you. Most women have that voice, right? And so 
Now, what do you think it does for women who have that voice if you, their husband, every time a beautiful woman passes by are going like this? What do you think that does? What if she knows that you have porno magazines or she knows you surf the net for that kind of stuff? Now, that's bad in itself. It's lust. I mean, it's, it's, your, it's a sin. But on the second hand, that really, really wounds and deeply hurts the woman you have been called to care for and love. There's no reason at all for you to notice the beauty of another woman and much less for you to tell another woman or tell another woman or your wife about that. Wow, honey, she's really hot. Who are you? Really, I mean, if that was my son-in-law, I'd knock his block off right there. Really, you shouldn't. This is, this is the thing. We, um, we as men, we do this. We compare our wives to other women. That's where it starts. We do that. They do that. We do that. We need to repent of that. The most beautiful woman in the world is your wife. You may not think that right now, but it's true. The most beautiful woman in the world is your wife. I know that's true for Anne. She's gorgeous. She's the woman of my dreams. I'm not just saying that. I know she's beautiful. And one of the things that helped me um, just never have the doubt about that is from the moment we got married, I prayed that Lord, that the Lord would give me a, a desire for her and a passion for her and a lust for her that just continues to grow stronger and stronger and stronger. And I, I tell you the truth, I'm not, I haven't struggled with looking at, at I mean, I'm not saying I don't notice beauty, but I just haven't struggled with some of the things that I, I know other men struggle with. Ask the Lord to help you focus your lust and your love and your passion and your desire on the woman that he has handed into your care. She is the most beautiful woman in the world. When you don't believe that or think that, you frustrate her. Okay, well, we're finished. The truth is um, that no man here, and myself included, will ever be a husband to our wives like Jesus is to the church. We have sinned, and we are going to sin again. We just are, but that brings us back to the free gift of forgiveness and grace that we were talking about in the beginning. Look, you are never going to be Jesus to your wife, but you can always have access to his strength and his power and his grace. So plead for that. Ask him to help you to be like him to your wife. Ask for forgiveness. Seek his grace. Seek his mercy. And love your wife like he loves the church. Let's close. Lord be with you. Father, thank you for um, this day and thank you for uh, this gift that we have been given, this call we've been given as husbands to love our wives and to give ourselves, sacrifice ourselves for her. Lord, I pray for every man here, um, especially every husband, that you give us this such a deep desire for and love for our wife, that this is a joy, that this sacrifice, that we're glad to do it. Um, Jesus loved us so much that he gladly laid his life down. Lord, I pray that we gladly are able to do the same for our wives. Um, I pray for those who are not yet married, Father, that um, the men here especially will be make wise decisions before they make their vows and seek women who are godly and who will support them as they seek to lead in a godly way. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Stand together and profess our faith.